This is Mrs. Hauser reading Chapter 2, Ralph's Decision. After his strenuous night of riding through puddles, fending off his relatives, trying to repair his motorcycle, and rebuilding his nest, Ralph napped soundly. He was awakened by the angry voice of Mr. Finch, the hotel manager, speaking to Mrs. Bramble, Ryan's mother. Look at that floor, Mr. Minch was saying. Disgraceful. It certainly needs a good cleaning, agreed Mrs. Bramble. Where's Matt, demanded Mr. Minch. Keeping the lobby clean is his responsibility. Worried because his friend was in trouble, Ralph peeped out from under the clock and saw Matt, unaware of the manager's displeasure, enter the lobby. Morning, Mrs. Bramble, Mr. Minch, Matt said. It's sure pretty outside, but the sun shining on the snow and the sky so blue. Mr. Minch ignored this greeting. Matt, he said, and his voice was stern. Take a good look at this floor. Dried mud on the linoleum. Mouse droppings all over the place. It's a disgrace. And the whole lobby smells, well, mousy. That's funny, thought Ralph. I can't smell a thing. Matt looked at the floor. Well, I'll be jiggered, he said. How do you suppose this happened? It looked clean enough last night. Liar, thought Ralph with affection. He knew Matt would never say a bad word against mice. Never mind how it happened, said Mr. Finch. Exactly what do you plan to do about it? Now take it easy, Mr. Finch, said Matt. I'll have this place cleaned up in no time. See that you do, said Mr. Minch. This may not be a first-class hotel, but there's no excuse for a dirty lobby. I realize that late arrivals often leave muddy floors, but mouse droppings? If I continue to find signs of mice, I shall have to let you go. That's not fair, thought Ralph. Who did not want to lose his loyal friend? Matt had been part of the hotel as long as he could remember, much longer than either Mr. Minch or Ryan's mother. Most employees did not stay long at the Mountain View Inn. Yes, sir, the cheer had gone out of Matt's voice. Ralph, who came from a long line of intelligent mice, knew that most of his relatives had learned to avoid traps and poisons. He was not so sure about his littlest relatives, however. What was left after traps and poisons? Cats. Ralph shuddered at the thought of bloodthirsty cats stalking his innocent little brothers, sisters, and cousins. The littlest one, who always became entangled in the carpet fringe, would be the first to go. A skier who was looking at headlines on the newspapers on the rack near the door overheard the conversation between Matt and Mr. Minch. There's a new electronic mouser on the market, he volunteered. It makes a noise only mice can hear and drives them out of the building in a hurry. I'll look into it. Something has to be done around here, said Mr. Minch, as he returned to his office. Ralph shuddered at the thought of an electronic mouser sending his family screaming into the snow to freeze to death. Mrs. Bramble wanted to say something pleasant to Matt after the unhappy incident. One good thing about the ski crowd, she remarked, they may track in snow, but they don't bother to drip dry a lot of clothes and clutter up the bathrooms. With that cheerful remark, she went upstairs to count sheets and towels in the linen room. More like a fourth-rate hotel, if you ask me, muttered Matt, who had seen better days. He dragged out the vacuum cleaner. Old Minch will never spend a nickel on an electronic mouser. How am I supposed to get rid of mice? Say, please, mousies, go away so old Mr. High and Mighty won't throw me out in the cold. As the vacuum cleaner roared back and forth across the carpet, Matt looked so worried that Ralph began to worry, too. What if the old man really did lose his job in the middle of winter? Where would he go? And what would Ralph do without his friend? He noticed that in spite of his worries, Matt did not run the vacuum cleaner near the hems of the curtains, a favorite hiding place of mice. Ralph sat back on his haunches and began his morning grooming. As he wiped his paws over his whiskers, he suddenly had a most unhappy thought. He was to blame for Matt's trouble. If he had been an ordinary mouse without a motorcycle, all his little relatives would not come flocking into the lobby. They would still live upstairs, snug in their nests behind the baseboards, growing fat on crumbs from all the food skiers smuggled into their rooms to avoid the dining room prices. Ralph paused in his washing to think. If he moved back upstairs, his relatives would follow. But what about his motorcycle? He couldn't leap up a flight of stairs with it. Neither could he leave it behind. Never. If he left it behind, some of his older cousins would grab it and stay in the lobby, at least until they wore it out or wrecked it, and the younger relatives would stay too. 
What was Ralph to do? He was still turning over the problem in his mind when the clock above him ground and groaned and managed to bring out eight bongs. Right on schedule, Ryan came running into the lobby, warmly dressed to go to that mysterious place known as school. He was carrying his books and lunch in the backpack. Ralph admired his waffle stompers. The muddy floor caught Ryan's attention. He studied the mud, and when Matt left to fetch a mop, he got down on the floor in front of the clock and pressed his cheek against the floor so that he could speak to Ralph. I saw your tire tracks, he whispered. I bet you had a great time last night. Yeah, except for a bunch of little mice, said Ralph. What's the matter, Ryan asked him. You sound unhappy. Suddenly, Ralph knew what he had to do. He thought fast, which was easy for him. Mice often have to think fast to survive. Look, Ryan, he said, I'm in trouble, and I don't have time to tell you about it. Just take me and my motorcycle with you and don't ask questions. To school? Ryan was surprised. Come on, begged Ralph. We're friends, aren't we? Sure, we're friends, agreed Ryan, but... There's no time for but, said Ralph, who knew Ryan would soon have to leave to catch the school bus. Well, okay, if you say so, said Ryan. By the time okay had passed Ryan's lips, Ralph was wheeling out his motorcycle with his crash helmet dangling from the handlebars. I'll stay out of sight, he assured his friend. There must be some place I can live at school. Ryan stuffed the motorcycle into one pocket of his parka and picked Ralph up carefully so he wouldn't smash his tiny ribs. You mean you want to stay at school? Yes, said Ralph, suddenly frightened by his decision. There must be some place I can hide. Ryan thought a moment. Well, there's one of Melissa Hopper's boots. You could hide there. Doesn't she wear her boots? Asked Ralph, picturing himself squashed in the toe of a boot by the foot of Melissa, whoever she was. Not if she can help it, said Ryan. Melissa hates boots, so she leaves them at school. That way her mother can't make her wear them. A sensible girl, thought Ralph. Mrs. Bramble came bustling back into the lobby. Ryan, what on earth are you doing on your knees? You should be on your way out to the highway or you'll miss your bus. Just check on the floor for dust, said Brian, as he quickly slid Ralph into his parka pocket. Bye, Mom. And he ran out the door and went crunching through the snow to the highway. Ryan must have had second thoughts about taking Ralph to school. He said, I guess Miss Kay won't mind. Who's Miss Kay? asked Ralph. My teacher, explained Ryan. Her real name is Miss Kuckenbacker. But she told us to call her Miss Kay, because calling her Miss Kuckenbacker would take up too much classroom time. Oh, said Ralph, mystified. To Ralph, school was a strange place, strange and mysterious place. When he had been a very young mouse, Ralph had pictured school as something like a bus, because mothers and fathers who arrived at the hotel with seven children, several children after a long, hot drive across the Sacramento Valley or the long, winding road over the Sierra Nevada often said, I'll be so glad when school starts. Ralph had naturally concluded that because a school started, it must also move like a car. As Ralph had grown more sophisticated from listening to children, he came to understand that children moved. School st stood still. Later on, he learned that some grown-ups called teachers also went to school. Some of these teachers stayed in the hotel during the summer. As far as Ralph could see, teachers behaved like ordinary people, except that, unlike parents, they said, oh dear, school will, be, will soon be starting. Ralph found a clue as to what teachers did in that mysterious place from a television commercial shown several, several times a day. In it, a woman who said she was a teacher held a tube of toothpaste in her hand as she walked around saying, toothpaste doesn't excite me, good checkups excite me. This remark puzzled Ralph, however. When he had lived upstairs, he had once tasted toothpaste when a careless guest left the cap off a tube. He found himself foaming and frothing at the mouth as he skittered around frantically trying to find water while one of the maids ran down the hall shrieking, Mad Mouse! Mad Mouse! No, Ralph could not agree with the television teacher. Toothpaste was exciting. This Miss Kay, said Ralph, as Ryan reached the bus stop. Is she okay? Yeah, she's pretty good. Ryan stamped his feet to keep them warm. She thinks up interesting things to do for language arts, like our school is named the Erwin J. Sneed Elementary School, and last week she had us write a composition about who we thought Erwin J. Sneed was and why the town of Cucaracha, California, 
named its school after him. Ryan scooped up a handful of snow, squeezed it into a ball, and threw it at the branch of a pine tree. Snow slid off the branch and fell with a soft plop. Some kids made Erwin J. Sneed a monster from outer space, continued Ryan, but I made him a horse thief back in the gold rush days when Cucaracha was a mining town. I said he was the first person to go to jail in Cucaracha, so they named the school after him. Miss K gets real excited about Cucaracha being a gold rush town with a lot of history. Oh, said Ralph, puzzled. Who was Erwin J. Sneed, really? Just some old guy on the school board when the school was built way back in the 1970s, explained Ryan, as he made another snowball. Ryan can make no sense of this information at all. As a snowball made more snow plop from a branch to the ground, Ryan had a sudden thought. I'd better be careful about talking to you at school, or people will think I'm nuts. Maybe some of them could understand me, suggested Ralph. They might even like to see me ride my motorcycle. Ryan considered. You better not go showing off. Somebody might steal your motorcycle, or maybe everybody would start bringing mice and motorcycles to school. I don't think that would be a good idea. A whole school full of mice tearing around on motorcycles? One mouse can get by, but not a lot of mice. You know how some people get all worked up about mice. As the school bus came rumbling down the highway, Ralph had to agree from his hotel experience that Ryan was right. One mouse or even two or three could get by, Many mice could not. Say, he said, you don't suppose there are already mice in this place? No, said Ryan, as the bus stopped in front of him. Mr. Costa keeps our school too clean for mice. Of course, Ralph's feelings were hurt. Remember to keep out of sight were Ryan's last words to Ralph as he climbed on the bus. Deep inside the parka pocket, Ryan felt sad, brave and noble, frightened and bewildered. He felt sad because there had been no time to say goodbye to Matt. He felt brave and noble because his going into the strange world would protect the safety of his little relatives. He felt frightened and bewildered because so much had happened so fast. Yet the inside of the pocket was cozy. In the deepest corner, Ralph found a dried up raisin that would have made an excellent breakfast if he had not been so nervous about what lay ahead in that mysterious place. The Irwin J. Sneed Elementary School. He nipped a tiny bite of the raisin and told himself school must be safe because so many children went there. Of course I will be all right, he told himself, pretending to be brave, but I will be careful to stay away from Miss Kay's toothpaste.